Our next guest is truly, truly a pioneer in the industry. Um, is currently working on helping humanity to become a multi-planetary species uh, with his startup uh, and company called Moon Express. And you're also the reason, in a lot of ways, why we're here. You were one of the uh, founding trustees of Singularity University. Um, so you and Peter and Ray and a, a few others have really put this together in the, in the very first place. Um, so Bob, I'm super psyched to have you here. And uh, we just briefly chatted um, when you came on stage. You just did a big announcement around getting us to the moon. Can you say a little bit more about like what is it you're doing and, and how you're achieving this? Sure, sure. Let me, let me say it's, just, it's great to be here in Singularity Hub. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan <laughs> and uh, very happy to be here and talk about a project that really has a origin coincident with Singularity University itself. Everything that's, we're talking about exponentials here at Singularity University, of course, and for some reason things that are our, our grand challenge level seem to take about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's been 10 years since the first seeds of Singularity University sprouted. And it's been 10 years, uh, uh, just over 10 years, that I've been working on a vision to expand the economic sphere of Earth outward to the moon and beyond. And you know, we, we, live, uh, we live in a world that ultimately has finite resources. Uh, stressed by, by societal forces, uh, that uh, uh, even with the application of exponential technologies that is going to radically improve the condition of life on this planet, this is still just a beginning for humanity. And we really need to expand as a multi-world species. And we live in a universe uh, so vast beyond human comprehension. We've only scratched the surface. We've only put human footprints down in our next world called the moon. Yeah. Back in the 60s, 40 or 50 years ago, we talk a lot about these, I'm going like this because we talk a yeah. lot about exponentials Sorry. at Singular University. We are at the knee of the curve, not just about an explosion of exponential technology that will transform humanity, but a transformation of the species from the Earth into space. Perhaps as profound as the emergence from life in the oceans to life in the land, we as a species and all the other species of Earth are emerging from the surface of the Earth into the ocean of space. So to me, the first logical step is you look on the horizon if you're on an island, if you imagine the planet Earth on an island floating in space, and you look, if you're on an island looking to the horizon, where do you paddle, where do you go? Well, if you see another island on the horizon, that's where you go. That's what the moon is, the planet Earth. It's a sister world within reach. Obviously, we've been there in the 60s, but now we need to utilize the moon and the resources we've recently discovered there. As a, as a platform to learn how to become a multi-world species and to launch us to Mars and beyond. And Moon Express, the company that I founded with Naveen Jain and Barney Pell, two other people very familiar to Singularity University, uh, in 2010, we've, uh, we've just unveiled an architecture for robotic exploration that is going to do for lunar exploration what CubeSats did for exploration of Earth orbit. So not all our uh, viewers might be super familiar with like the concept of CubeSats. Um, can you can you elaborate a little bit more? Sure, like, and, sure. Because I went like that, right? Yeah, that yeah, means, I know. Like, right. Kind of like small. Because yeah, totally. there is there are satellites can be as you know half the size of this room. Right. And 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 so, very very similar to what what happened in the computation world from main fr the mainframe era of computers, mm -hmm. things that were government centric and filled a room were transformed into personal PCs that completely democratize access to computation. That's what's happening in space. We're moving from the era of a long dominated world of government space. And we're democratizing access to space through a collapse of technology in many ways. Computation is transforming hardware into software. And it's expanding accessibility. So the costs are coming down. The, uh, the, the, the iterations are going up. And, uh, and, and the long tail of the market, meaning the rest of us, have access to space. And a small group of individuals, Moon Express I think is a great example, 50, 100 people, can do what only superpowers used to be able to do. Reach for another world, land on another planet. That's what's happening in space. And that's, when I go like that for CubeSats, yeah. that's the physical representation of, the, of what exponential technology does to collapse large hardware systems into small systems that from a cost perspective are much less expensive to launch into space than large systems. 
that's really fascinating. Um, you hit on something uh, in your earlier sentence around um, the economic aspect of us going to moon. So it's not just like us going to moon because it's what we should do or, you know, because it's a nice postcard picture or you right. see Earth right. rising instead of moon rising. Right. But there's right. an economic point in there, right? And there has to be, because yeah. we went to the moon, we as a human species, led right. by the United States, this, this superpower race between the Soviet Union and the United States was about superpower politics. It was, a, it was about, about political and psychological dominance. Mm -hmm. It was about proving that we were better than the other guy. And, and, we, and, and we planted flags with human species and, and walked around, but much faster than it took to get there. We abandoned the moon. It took us 10 years, which was remarkable, yeah. right? To go from nothing to landing on the humans on the moon. Yeah. And then within three years, we abandoned it. Between 1969 and 1972, only six people actually walked on the moon. We abandoned it. That's because the premise was we were in a race to prove supremacy. In the decades since, we've discovered that the moon isn't this, let me do this, this dry rock that we kind of thought it was in the 60s. It's actually a world with vast resources. Hmm. Um, the moon as a world was enriched through asteroid bombardment and its early formation, just like the Earth was enriched. So everything we mine on Earth, the platinum group metals, the nickel, the silver, iron, all of these things came from outer space, mm -hmm. right? And the early, I'm going like this because it's the early yep. bombardment yep. of asteroids and meteorites in that molten Earth. And the moon was forming at the same time, but the moon, being a smaller body, cooled much faster. So what happened is everything that was enriching the Earth was also enriching the moon, but it was hitting a hard body. So it was either vaporizing or shattering right. and accumulating on the moon. So if you look up at the moon, what do you see mostly? What's the most prevalent kind of feature? Silvery surface and then like all the puck and crate, puck marks, right? Craters. The craters. Every yeah. crater is a is a scar yeah. of an asteroid strike. Right. Right? So we have map the mineralogy of the moon probably better than we've mapped the mineralogy of Earth if you include the oceans. And there are vast resources there, but the most important discovery, which is only in the last 10 years of accumulating evidence, and then thanks to NASA in 2011, we have the steaming gun evidence that there's water on the moon. Mm -hmm. That's a transformational subject. Right. Because water, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, um, is not only the stuff that supports life, but it's the stuff of rocket fuel. So hydrogen and oxygen form rocket fuel. It's transformational because the moon becomes a gas station in the sky, right? Uh, water is like the oil of the solar system. So that is the game changer, not just for the economics of all the resources in the moon, but the economics of getting anywhere else in the solar system. So if you take this a step further, like what is your like ideal vision of this future? Like, so you're bringing your stuff and, to moon, that's right. one step, right? Sure, so in, in the big picture, in the singularity realm, a future of abundance, where we're embracing the resources of the universe, uh, instead of fighting over crumbs in this little supermarket we call the Earth, the universe, the solar system, is, has practically infinite resources and energy, so we need to embrace the resources of space in order to be able to expand as a species. So that's the big picture, and for Moon Express, um, our long-term vision is to unlock the resources of the moon for the benefit of humanity. Mm -hmm. so, so find out where those resources are, find out how to extract them and how to process them, store them and use them. In the short term, we're a transportation company. We are on the final stretch of, we hope, becoming the first private company to reach the moon within the next year. Something that only superpowers have done before yeah. with small robotic explorers that will open up and democratize access to the moon so we can learn more about it. And these will be stepping stones for a larger exploration and uh, resource searching on the moon. So that's the, like a commercial kind of like, for me is like a, like a mining operation type of thing. Harvesting. Harvesting, right. Yes. What do you think yeah. is the, do you think, uh, you know, Richard Branson runs around and tells the world and, and sells tickets, right? For us to go into space adventure. Oh, when will we go? Yeah. Yeah, when will this get? happen, right? When will like, we go? And when can you and I buy go? a ticket? Well, will we go? Oh, absolutely. Huh. So I used to, when I was a little boy, I used to think, boy, it would be cool to go into space, but I think I have to be a NASA astronaut and I have to work for the government, and it, it never happened. Now I can just go to Richard Branson and sure. put down, write a check that will hopefully clear and go to check, uh, go to space. So I, must, I'm, I feel the same way about the moon. I believe that I, I could actually buy a ticket to go to the moon someday uh -huh. in my lifetime, and, and the kids that are born today 
Uh, it's, just, it's just a certainty in my mind for them. I think the generation of kids that are being born right now will look up in the next 10 years, look up at the moon and see lights on the moon. Imagine seeing lights on the moon and, and, and how that will be a fundamental change to our human psychology yeah. to know that we're members of a spacefaring species. Absolutely. Right. So the first jobs will be a little tough. It'll probably be on the world's dirtiest jobs, but it'll be on the moon. <laughs> But uh, it will be a great place to go once you get a little, a few of the amenities that we yeah. like. Um, we'll redefine honeymoon. Uh, that's where you'll be able to go. <laughs> right? Um, that's what a moon is all about. Uh, Roma, and there'll be a lot of fun things to do in the moon, but it'll be practical because it'll be economic right. to be there as, as well as fun. It throws up interesting questions around like who owns it? Like who owns moon? That's a, that's a, that's a great point. Right. And it's actually become, um, you know, you look at the risks of a startup enterprise and uh, uh, most startups have this uh, v you know, very common risks like money and resources and the right mm -hmm. people. Those are very common, whether you're doing a space or, a, or an app um, on an iPhone. So it turns out that in the 1960s, uh, during a, the Cold War era, if you can imagine, we were, we were locked in this struggle of potential nuclear annihilation in the Cold War and amassing tens of thousands of nuclear weapons pointed at each other is not the best time. And, 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 and technology to send things into space was just arising. So the, so the United States and the Soviet Union, as the primary parties in discussion, joined with other countries, got together and said, how are we going to behave in space? How do we, how do we prevent, let's say, a nuclear arms race in space? Let's not take our war in, how do we do this? So a document was developed and signed in 1967 called the Outer Space Treaty that has since been signed by over 100 nations that to this day governs the behavior of human society in space led by nation states. And it has uh, precepts that are quite grand. Um, uh, space is the province of all mankind. Uh, we shall put no weapons of mass destruction in space. We're not going to put military bases on the moon. We're going to, uh, the moon and all celestial bodies um, uh, are, 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 can, can, can be used by anybody, but also they can't be appropriated. So mm. it's got this, this, this tension between belief systems yep. that is open to interpretation by those signatories to that treaty. So the short answer is who owns the moon? Everyone and no one. Interesting. Right? So as the first private sector company to go there, um, we found ourselves in a situation in late 2015 where, um, you know, is there, uh, do you need a license to go to the moon? Can you right. just go to the moon? Right. And uh, so in, in order to get a commercial launch license that's in a satellite into, into Earth orbit, there's a very standard routine process. It's managed by the Federal Aviation Administration. Every rocket that gets, commercial rocket that gets licensed to launch goes through this process. But all of that regulatory framework ends a few hundred miles above the Earth's surface no private company has ever gone beyond Earth orbit. It's only been government spacecraft right. that have gone to other worlds. So when we uh, went to the State Department, which is the federal body that interprets treaties and yep. uh, is responsible for the U.S. obligations under the Outer Space Treaty, and we said, hey, uh, we'd like to send some robots to the moon. Um, are you guys okay with that? <laughs> I mean, is uh, there any reason why that's a problem? And they, they said, uh, after some thought, they said, uh, well, we really support, in principle, what you want to do. We think it's great, but there's no way we could say yes to that. The reason is, there's no department. It's not that sure. the United States thinks it owns the moon. Yeah, it's yeah, because sure. in order to be compliant with its international right. obligations, it needs to have authorization and supervision. It has to know it's, there was no department of the moon. There was no regulatory framework. Yeah. Make a long story short, it took us almost a year to actually there was not even a process for the process. So we had to invent something out of thin air, we called it mission approval, and we went to the 10 or 12 federal agencies all involved in this process of approving things that go into space, and, and, and developed this consensus that uh, has become a historic point in history. In, 20, in 2016, on July 20th, the US government approved for the first time ever, actually in the world, a commercial entity to go beyond Earth orbit and to the moon, and that was Moon Express, setting some level of precedent that at least it's possible, but that conversation about how it's going to happen continuously is still moving. Wow. Yeah, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. That's a seriously exponential journey. Yes, huh. yes. On that note, on this ex truly exponential journey, um, I want to wrap it up. 
Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great. I learned so much about the moon. I'm so excited to buy my ticket uh, to go to the moon, not just into orbit, but, but go to, to the, the moon. moon. All right. Uh, and I want to see your uh, harvesting operations uh, in full swing. I'll bring you back a piece of the moon. Fantastic. All thank right. You so great much. to see you. Thank you.